Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Norman, for the introduction. Thank you, the ILC, for putting together this meeting. I mean, as a part of the planning committee, I know the fact how challenging it was, but how with the accomplishment that we have had today. So um, my talk today is more about the practical uh, approach for uh, cardiology in EDS, right? So what we know about cardiology in EDS, I don't have anything to disclose here. <clears throat> um, we're gonna deal in the beginning with the cardiodynamic function in patients with EDS. We're gonna talk a little bit about POTS in EDS, what the evidence that we have, because as a Mac, McMaster alumni, I believe in evidence, uh, I believe in numbers, but as a methodologist, I believe in the good way to do research, right? So, so not everything that is published or you see in the news or you read about it is actually truth or close to the truth, right? Because of the bias that we have. So that's important for all of us as physicians and also as a patients to understand that we, we, we have to critically appraise all this um, uh, evidence. Uh, and then at the end, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Hamilton experience, what we have done in Hamilton the last year. Thanks to this meeting last year, right, so when I talk about POTS in general, uh, the question came out that why we don't do some research, some uh, reviews in uh, patients with EDS. And, and we have been able to put together some data to show you today uh, about the Hamilton experience. Um, in terms of, um, let me see what's going on. I have a technical problem here. In terms of um, cardiovascular disease, uh, we know that it's a well-known uh, complication of EDS. Uh, vascular EDS, for instance, is, is one of the, the worst uh, type of, of um, conditions because it can lead to actual death, right? So the, the, quality of the, the mortality of this patient is actually high. And we have sudden vascular ruptures, we have aortic root dilation and dissections that can actually compromise the life of our patients. Most of the early studies done in, in EDS and cardiovascular disease were done in a broad population not classified, right? So they were done in the 60s and 80s, and we didn't have the criteria that we have today, and we didn't have the technology to actually identify the different types at that time. So the early, early studies, they show a combination of uh, conditions and the complications associated with the cardiovascular system. Now, in terms of heart rate and ECG findings, um, we uh, recently, uh, Cameron et al. Uh, studied 28 patients, right, so with EDS, joint hypermobility syndrome, and compared with controls, and they look at the different changes in the ECGs. And when I'm talking about ECGs, I'm talking about conduction abnormalities of the heart, right? So it's the electrocardiogram that you get in your emergency department and your cardiologist's office. And uh, this simple paper, a simple piece of paper, gives us a lot of information about how uh, is the function of the conduction, electrical wires of the heart. Um, so for that reason, these uh, researchers, they read all these ECGs in the selected population, they compare with uh, the normal ones. And they found an increased uh, risk, an increased heart conditions associated with, uh, conduction disorder associated with EDS. However, those findings were almost benign. It means that they didn't have any actual impact in the conduction system of the heart. So they were not leading to arrhythmias. So this is, if I do an ECG in all of you guys here, I'm probably gonna find out the same type of rate of, of complications that the normal population, right? So, and EDS is happening the same. Now, these unexpected findings, we don't know if they have an impact in the overall cardiovascular risk in the future. Because again, they are unspecific, and they are not actually related with the specific uh, conduction abnormalities of the heart. Um, we have some uh, cardiac arrhythmia hypothesis, and, and these researchers in Harvard, they basically uh, hypothesized that uh, maybe the reason why this patient has this conduction normalities is because um, the connective tissue in the heart is also affected, right? And that can lead to different type of um, <coughs> arrhythmias or a small findings that we have in these populations. Uh, now, it could be secondary to cardiovascular uh, dysautonomia, is another question. And also, it's secondary to 
changes in hemodynamic control in these patients because as uh, Dr. Rowe talked about, these patients, they have highly uh, incidence or prevalence of um, orthostatic hypotension. So why is happening with these patients? Why does they get uh, venous pooling? Why do they have acrocyanosis? Is that having an impact in the heart and in the cardiac, in autonomic regulation? That's certainly what we need to uh, find out. And the evidence is poor. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a Dr. Francomano's paper, yes. So um, Dr. Francomano did a review on patients with EDS and uh, her group basically uh, explore or identify different changes in the echocardiogram, looking for heart function damage or uh, evidence of uh, cardiomyopathies. And basically what they found was that um, there were significant changes in a, a valvular disease, either aortic or uh, mitral regurgitation or uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Those findings were around 30% um, of all the patients with EDS in that small cohort. Um, but that tells you that uh, there could be an impact in the way, they, in the heart function in the EDS population. Now, the risk of developing heart disease in these patients is low because these conditions, mild mitral regurgitation, mild mitral tricuspid regurgitation, as long as they don't have hemodynamic changes, they don't affect your um, overall cardiovascular health. Same thing with mitral valve labs. I pretty much, uh, some of our patients here in the, in the audience, they have been diagnosed with mitral valve labs. But what is the, the actual prognosis of mitral valve prolapse? It can lead to symptoms? Yes, no questions. Some of the angina pain, some of the uh, discomfort in the chest may be associated with that, but it's not clear in the long term. And we, they found also uh, that the tapers of those patients, they have some sort of diastolic dysfunction. And that means that the filling of the left ventricle could be affected. And that's most likely related with uh, con uh, connective tissue uh, disease. Recently, Camerota uh, studied uh, the same population, 28 patients with EDS, and the only finding that we, they have was mild uh, uh, anticuspid uh, valve insufficiency regurgitation and mild valve prolapse. Um, the three patients, they have pulmonary hypertension, and again, this is a small sample, so we cannot extrapolate the general populations with uh, EDS. We move towards the autonomic dysfunction, right? Um, we know that autonomic dysfunction in EDS um, and uh, um, joint hypermobility syndromes um, has been identified, has been uh, reported in the past. Uh, we do know that uh, these symptoms of dysautonomia can be associated with non-musculatical complaints. So it's all about the patient's report. I have palpitations, I have uh, uh, syncope, chronic orthostatic intolerance, I have um, uh, chest pain, I have uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. The patients, uh, they have um, IBS, chronic diarrhea, chronic pain. Um, and uh, constipation, and as well as thermal regulatory um, complaints. So all these symptoms are unspecific, but if you put them together, right, so you identify that this is probably coming from the autonomic nervous system. Um, and um, they have a, quite an impact in the quality of life, right? Because imagine, if you put these things together, you will see uh, um, that the patient probably won't be able to function in the daily basis. And that's how we see in our clinic uh, the disability of, of, of POTS and dysautonomia in these populations. Now, in other conditions such as diabetes and heart failure, autonomic dysfunction can lead to poor outcomes increased mortality, increased comorbidities. We know, we do know now uh, these things in the last, uh, from the, the last uh, 40 years, we have been able to identify these markers that can predict bad outcomes in, in, in cardiovascular disease. So the question is, what is the impact of autonomic dysfunctions in patients with EDS? They're gonna have, uh, uh, what are gonna be the outcomes of, of these patients? We do not have that evidence because we don't have the cohorts and the uh, follow-up of these patients, of these models. Thanks. So now, um, recently the Belgian, Belgian group um, uh, report uh, autonomic symptoms burden in patients with hypermobility type of uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. 
uh, it was a comparative study with uh, two uh, with controls, basically, and fibromyalgia patients. Uh, they found that autonomic symptoms are more uh, in EDS patients are more prevalent in the cardiovascular and GI uh, systems, right? So, and they have um, they increase uh, they have an increase in uh, um, severity of quality of life, right? So, impairment in quality of life. Uh, they have also some reports of peripheral neuropathies in those patients. They have a lack of association with um, affective distress or decondition, so they couldn't find a relationship between uh, the symptoms of dysautonomia and uh, mood disorders, for instance, anxiety or depression. Now, the impact of autonomic uh, symptoms was higher in EDS patients that uh, compared with the other types of EDS. And, and again, they, they, they divide patients with vascular EDS, they divide patients with classical uh, EDS and, and hypermolite type, and they found that the impact of autonomic dysfunction is higher in the patients with hypermolite uh, type. Okay, so now, um, Gassett, uh, in 2003, he compared 48 patients with uh, hypermolic joint, uh, joint hypermolic syndromes versus control. And he actually one of the first ones that measure um, autonomic function in those patients. And um, <clears throat> they measure, he measure um, bar effect sensitivity, which is a surrogate measure of the autonomic function. And also he did pharmacological challenges to um, assess the sensitivity of the alpha uh, or the adrenergic system, the sympathetic nervous system. And he found that those patients were more hypersensitive, they were more hypersensitive to adrenaline. Um, and that's something that we have seen in the clinic. I always tell my patients, what happened when you um, change temperature, what happened when you are in pain, right? So you have adrenaline rushes, and that's how he ha can have an impact in the autonomic nervous system, and some of those symptoms that you see are related with this hyperenergic state. And that's what these guys reported in uh, 2003. Now, why we have this sympathetic response? Why we have this increase in sympathetic activation in patients with EDS? There are different things. One thing could be a primary damage of the uh, autonomic nervous system, and the second thing could be a, as a consequence of something, right? And uh, what I think is happening in, in patients with EDS is that we are dealing with the tip of the iceberg when we have autonomic dysfunction. We know that something has happened underlying, and the way that the system reacts, the autonomic system, actually the autonomic nervous system is doing what it has supposed to do, defend yourself against some external aggression, right? So, and in this case, could be the lack of volume that you have in, in, in EDS, uh, the lack of uh, vascular control in the lower limbs, the fact that your blood is in your legs all the time and you cannot compensate. So what you do is start and is increase your sympathetic activity to compensate, and that can lead to tachycardia and the symptoms that we see in uh, these populations. <clears throat> Now, um, the same group, the Belgian group, this year published another paper um, looking at 39 females with EDS and 38, 35 uh, match controls. He measured resting autonomic tone with uh, heart variability and blood reflex sensitivity. And he all, uh, they also did autonomic reactivity using QSERT, which is basically sweating, sweat test to measure the activity of sympathetic nervous system in the, in the sweat glands. Um, he also, uh, the, the, his group also did um, head up tilt tests, uh, and they actually calculate the composite autonomic severity score, which is, a, uh, is, a, is, a, is actually a score that we use in the clinical practice to determine the severity of the disease. It's what developed in the Mayo Clinic uh, in one of the autonomic centers in the States, and we use them to assess the severity of the disease. Now, <clears throat> They found that the heart availability in some patients with EDS was elevated. It was not statistically significant, but there was a signal. Um, and again, they, they found that there is some sort of sympathetic abnormality that they couldn't explain uh, uh, you know, uh, clearly. The parasympathetic nervous system, which is the vagal system, has been intact in these populations. So all the studies that we I reviewed basically don't report any findings or any challenges in the parasympathetic nervous system, everything is more likely sympathetic, hyperadrenergic, or hyperadrenaline-driven. Uh, the head-up-tilt test, 
they found that these patients, they increased heart rate during orthostatic stress, which could be related with the POTS in this population. When they did the CAS score, which is an objective measure of the severity of the autonomic dysfunction, they found the majority of the patients, right, they have moderate and mild dysautonomia, right? And this is actually good because it's telling us that uh, there is a spectrum of, 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 of symptoms of dysautonomia in these patients. And also it's telling us that uh, it's something that we can actually treat. When we have patients with severe dysautonomia, we're talking about severe diseases associated with autonomic dysfunction. We're talking about amyloid, cancers. We're talking about autoimmune diseases. Those patients are the ones that are most uh, likely impaired in terms of cardiovascular regulation. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> They also check for sympathetic dysfunction and southern motor dysfunction. Again, sympathetic nervous system is the one that is, is, is affected. And they have normal parasympathetic reactivity. So this is an objective way to measure the autonomic function and the severity of the autonomic function. And we know now that POTS and EDS, they are in the mild and moderate uh, uh, site. Now, orthostatic intolerance uh, and um, autonomic uh, dysfunction in EDS and POTS. Now, um, there is always uh, this 41% uh, of patients, right, so with uh, uh, EDS and POTS in this uh, cohort, they have POTS response during head up tilt test. They have gravel hypotension uh, in about uh, 20 patients, and they also have, uh, as Dr. Rowe mentioned, uh, evidence of neurocarogenic uh, responses or acute low blood pressure attacks. That's what we call the vasovagal syncope. So this is telling you that, and vasovagal syncope, how I explain to my patients and my colleagues, is just the end point of an overload of the system, right? So, and that's how when you uh, withdraw. And you, you do it to protect yourself, right? So, and you all withdraw in the system to make sure that you reset your system and get back to normal. So that's how we see uh, vasovagal syncope nowadays. Now, I mentioned this before, the underlying uh, mechanism of dysautonomia, peripheral neuropathy, most likely sympathetic dysfunction, uh, increased uh, blood vessel distensibility, distance, allow, allowing to more venous pooling. Um, now, these patients with EDS, they have a lot of medication that can be vasoactive. So it's not helping at all, right? Because the opioids, right, so um, sleeping pills, they have, they produce orthostatic hypotension, right? So you have to be extremely careful in the medications that you use in these populations because they can also contribute to the symptoms that they have. Now, <clears throat> depression, anxiety, decondition, and pain, in, uh, pain can induce increased sympathetic activity. So those are the things that we have to uh, identify. This is what happened in my clinic, okay? So, and that's the reason that I uh, actually learned about this, okay? Because when I started, some of my patients came to my clinic and they knew more than I knew about uh, EDS and dysautonomia, right? And I thank you for them, right? But I also um, warn you that you have to be extremely careful, right? because it's always important to have a formal diagnosis. So Dr. Google can give you a lot of answers, right, sometimes, but what is the, the actual um, impact individually is something that we don't know, right? So and that's why we have to do these things to make sure that we come up with um, guidelines and criteria to uh, identify these patients and treat these patients. I'm gonna talk quickly about POTS in EDS. Um, um, uh, POTS, as you probably know, increasing heart rate more than 30, 40 beats per minute during the standing. There are different subtypes. This is the general population with POTS, right? So we have neuro, neuro, neuropathic subtype, hyperarrhythmic subtype, physical decondition, and volume-related uh, POTS. Um, <clears throat> there is one paper published uh, uh, in uh, 2010 that showed that uh, they compared 20 patients with POTS and uh, 20 patients with, uh, 20, 26 patients with POTS and joint hyperlonic syndrome and 39 patients with POTS. They found that the mean age uh, uh, of POTS with EDS was in young adults, right? So 24 years old. Uh, they found that migraine was a comorbidity that these patients report most of the time. And they found also in EDS patients that pregnancy, for instance, or a surgery was a trigger. This is similar to what happened in POTS patients as well, in patients without EDS, okay? 
Um, and again, the common complaints were the fatigue, the orthostatic uh, hypotension, the palpitations, the presyncope, and certainly the syncope. Um, there is a, a recently published a retrospective review of uh, 109 medical records showing uh, the prevalence of EDS in POTS patients, and they found out that probably it's around 18%, which is, which is quite high. Um, certainly more prevalent in females than male. And um, the prevalence of EDS in the general population is quite, you know, it's roughly 0.02%, right? So that's what we know. So if you put all the patients with POTS, right, so you actually, if you diagnose a patient with POTS, you actually have to think about the possibility of having EDS. And that's what I want to transfer to my colleagues in the general uh, um, uh, practices, right? So you need to understand that this is a subset of patients that can have both diseases, those, both syndromes. Now, <clears throat> the vascular subtype of, of, of EDS is not associated with POTS or with dysautonomia, and I want to make uh, clear that based on the recent da data. Um, <clears throat> Now, I'm gonna tell you about the Hamilton experience. So again, in five minutes, I'm gonna to try to summarize what we did. So last year, uh, after I leave the, this room, oh, well, in the other place in Oakville, uh, I, I said, we don't have any evidence of what is going on with uh, patients with EDS and POTS, and I, I certainly was seeing more and more of these patients in my practice. So <clears throat> we decided with one of the students, who is here, actually, um, to um, do a, chart review, a retrospective review and retrospective analysis of patients that I have seen in the clinic with uh, EDS diagnosed, uh, formal diagnosed by genetic uh, specialists and, uh, and POTS. And I compared two populations. I matched by gender and age, right? And um, uh, we have 23 patients with POTS EDS plus 20 patients with POTS alone. We did autonomic function testing, we did head up tail tests, we did cardiac impedance, which is a way that measure hemodynamic variables. We measure cardiac index, stroke volume, and total peripheral resistance on those patients, as well as we measure heart availability and BRS. We, uh, because it was a retrospective review, we used data from clinical uh, patients um, after approval for the REV in our institution. I'm gonna show you, this is our machine, so for some of my patients that have been in my lab, uh, they know pretty well this machine and the torture chamber that could be, right? So, but actually give us a lot of information about what happened with your dyna hemodynamics when you are standing and how we can actually um, identify changes in blood pressure and heart rate. The demographics between the two, patient, the two populations, all these patients, they have formal diagnosis of POTS, and that's important to clarify, right? So all these patients, they have orthostatic intolerance, all these patients, they have the heart rate changes in the clinic, so all these patients were diagnosed initially with POTS. The only the catch was that they were diagnosed also with EDS. Um, <clears throat> no statistical significant difference were found in terms of clinical uh, and demographic data. Of course, females more than uh, um, males certainly in those populations, and the other, uh, the other clinical factor were normal. At the end of the slide, they have the sim that symptoms, right? So as you can see, MSK, it's quite prevalent in patients with POTS and EDS. So I, I grouped them, you know, joint pain, joint dislocation, and so on. So we know that all the patients with EDS, they have the symptoms, but it's a set of patients with POTS alone that they also have chronic pain. The basal blood work, there was no major difference. We measured ferritin because ferritin has a low ferritin or deficiency anemia has been associated with POTS as well. And the numbers were similar as in both, both group. Again, this is a small population, but it's give you an idea or, or, or what is going on. The ECGs, no, no changes, no difference between two groups, right? So one of the prevalent things was incomplete right boundary branch block, which could be, again, a small, uh, um, uh, signal telling you about the possibility of conduction normalities that could be related with um, connective tissue disease in the heart uh, muscle. Echo, <clears throat> um, as we expected, we, don't have, we, we didn't find any difference between the two groups. All the echo findings were pretty much uh, as similar. Uh, we, all, we, we did find that there was some mitral regurgitation uh, in three patients with uh, POTS and EDS, which 10% of the population. And, uh, Dr. Franco Mano in her study report 18%, right? So there is some sort of uh, possibilities that, you know, because the sample was smaller, right? So that could be, uh, um, you know, related or coherent. This is important slide, right? So we did the hemodynamics of these patients in um, the sitting position, spine position and the standing. 
And we look at the heart rate, the stroke um, blood pressure, stroke blood pressure, we could stroke index, cardiac index, and we also do uh, some sort of um, cardiac uh, function indexes that we calculate using the um, uh, cardiac impedance. And we did not find any difference between the two groups, which tells me that the POTS manifestation in the two groups is the same. The underlying trigger of POTS in this patient is, could be the difference between the regular patients with POTS alone. So heart availability, same thing. We didn't have any difference between the two groups. And uh, we, again, the limitations of the study is we couldn't measure actually sympathetic uh, activations. We have the technique called the micronograpy, which is basically go to the nerve, one of the nerves in your leg, and try to measure the activity of the sympathetic nervous system. That's actually what we call the gold standard, but it's a technically difficult technique to perform, especially in young kids, will be a quite burden. So in conclusion, <clears throat> there's no difference in hemodynamic variables in patients with POTS and EDS. Um, Postural electrostatic tachycardia could be the final pathway, right? Um, Good news is that we can use similar treatments for both conditions, right? So we use volume, non-pharmacological management of orthostatic hypotension with volume, volume salt, uh, exercise, compression stockings, and uh, crossing uh, counter pressure maneuvers. And we can also do the same pharmacological um, uh, therapies. And <clears throat> in patients with POTS, we, POTS, we don't know that they have low cardiovascular risk. So we can tell our patient with EDL, we, we will be able when we finish the big core studies, that uh, the risk of having cardiovascular disease associated with EDS and POTS may be low as patients with POTS in alone. Um, <clears throat> this is basically what I have uh, tell you. So we need to identify the symptoms. We need to identify uh, the, um, we need to do a multidisciplinary approach for these patients. That's why we have in the GTA, now we know the people that uh, is involved in POTS uh, and um, also in this autonomy and EDS. So I, I know now where to refer, where to send my patients, where to get the diagnosis, and also know that the other physicians in the community, they know when they have patients with orthostatic hypotension to refer to my lab. The future is doing more research and start cohorts and um, make sure that we are able to uh, develop evidence-based guidelines for those patients. I know Norman is just chasing me. I hope you don't. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What are you going to do with me? <laughs> it's threatening. Nothing, uh, nothing dangerous. <laughs> so okay, I'm, I'm going to get Dr. Vadas just to, I forget which computer you're using for your slides, but it's going to be changed. So if you want to come up and start sorting your computer, we'll take questions for... And if there are patient questions, you will find on your tables that there are little uh, papers that say patient question. You'll see that there is a, a patient question and answer session set in the... Uh, a little later on in today's session. If you want to write your question on that and uh, drop them off at this table here where Sandy's sitting and Susan and Alan and myself, and then we'll get them sorted out and try to get as many of them as we can in the patient session. So, Dr. Bader, if you want to fix your computer, and first question, please. We hear a lot about teams and concepts. I don't know how to use the key for a sympathetic system. Recently, there have been data with respect to the concept of post viral autoantibodies from Vanderbilt, Nebraska, with autoantibodies against the peripheral alpha receptor with a partial agonist uh, beta 1 mm -hmm. antibodies. I understand that. You know, any, uh, any thoughts on uh, whether that's the direction we should be pursuing? So, so we know that and autoimmune autonomic neuropathies in general, right? So we know that they are um, they present with at least two or three system uh, involvements, right? So if I have a patient that uh, present with severe IBS, gastroparesis, or to some hypotension, right? And uh, for instance, uh, blood dysfunction, those are the patients that I may be exploring this. The thing is, we don't have the resources in Canada. I have to send the, the, the autoimmune test into the state. But the ministry has been quite, uh, um, um, you know, um, 
open to fund these things, and uh, we're able to get the results. And I have a partner in, 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 in Hamilton, Dr. Baker, who is a um, neurologist, peripheral neuropathy expert, who does the autoimmune uh, uh, therapy for these patients. So we use Plex, we use uh, um, IVAG, and we're potentially using uh, biologics for these patients. But again, in this specific population, we don't have. In the autonomic populations, we have identified these things, absolutely. Have you any data to the Athens really focus on the Athens? Yeah, no, we, that's, that's part of the, the, the further you know, uh, research that we're going to do in this, case, in this population. Time for another question. Okay, I just found Good work. Uh, we, we perform structural damage that is you know, uh, affecting the brain stem and then certainly leading to the autonomic dysfunction. Different from the one that we see in the POTS patients without these findings. And that's what we, that we want to see these patients, right, to identify what is the actual autonomic dysfunction and how we can correlate with the echo, with the ultrasound, and with the findings in the, in the, in the heart. Thanks. Thanks. 